in Texas. I am also known as the Minister of Justice. My daughter and I, we have this YouTube channel called The Defiant Lawyers. And each and every week, typically on Saturday, we bring you a legal analysis of trending politics, policies, personalities, and pop culture to empower you with the information you need to defy an unjust legal system. Well, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you haven't um, engaged or commented on the show in the past, please do so. Um, we need your support. We're getting out very, very important information. Now, obviously, this is not our regular day of going live, which is Saturday. This is Monday. This is a very special Monday. This is June 10th, 2023. And obviously, June 10th has significant, significant meaning for the African American community because it has become the national holiday whereby we celebrate the end of slavery. But we know that it really started because the enslaved blacks here in Africa, down on Gavinston Beach, learned two, almost three years later, that slavery had ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. They got the news late, but they got it. And now that event has, has blossomed into, again, this national holiday we call Juneteenth. So, in celebration or in honor of Juneteenth, I am bringing you a very, very special show today. This show is about a man named George Anderson and his family. And what you see here is one of Mr. George Anderson's descendants. This is his great granddaughter, Linda Burton, and Miss Burton, I'm going to call her Linda. Linda joined me today so that she can talk to us about perhaps one of the greatest tragedies that has ever happened to a single African-American family. So we're going to share this story with you. Stay with us. We'll get into it in just a second. All right. Thank you for staying with us. Again, I am attorney Augustus Corbett. And with me, I have the pleasure of having Miss Linda Burton. Linda, how are you on this Juneteenth day? I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me. It is a great pleasure for you to have me on this broadcast and to talk about some of the things that has happened to our family. Yes. The beginning. Well, it's, it's an honor. Um, to have you up here representing your family. And um, so we're going to start just walking through <clears throat> the story of George Anderson, okay? Um, before we do that, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to get up here with me today. And <clears throat> I know that there are, there are family members of yours who are watching uh, the broadcast, um, sitting in very, um, you know, with bated breath, um, anticipating the telling of your family's tragedy. Okay, it's what I would call it. What a tragedy it is. And you said something um, a couple of conversations ago that I want to repeat because I agree with you. This may be, this may be, on an economic basis, even much worse than Black Wall Street. And that is how Tulsa, uh, part of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Greenwood section of Tulsa, 
uh, the thriving part of Tulsa that African Americans, uh, descendants of slaves, built a thriving community. And we know tra tragically, um, whites came in, killed two, three, killed about 300 people, and just tore Black Wall Street down. Well, the enormous wealth that um, is involved in this situation with your family really exceeds what happened in Tulsa, in the Greenwood section, like Wall Street. I agree with that. Now, let me say this. We're not making any allegations against anyone. We're not defaming anyone uh, or any entity. But this is a story that needs to be told. And we're going to tell this story. We're going to tell it in three parts. Today, Linda is going to talk to us about her, her ancestors, her great-grandfather, and her grandfather. And uh, on subsequent um, shows, we're going to have Linda back and maybe other family members where we will start to really delve into uh, the economics behind this story. So, as a short introduction, this man, this man, George Anderson, George Anderson, based on U.S. Census records, he was born in Alabama, and then he moved to Gregg County, Texas. East Texas, and Mr. Anderson, Mr. George Anderson, was able to acquire 188 acres of land in Gregg County. And beneath that land was a lot of oil, a lot of gas, a lot of it. He well, I mean, that's pretty exceptional for a black man back in that day to obtain, to acquire all that land and all that wealth under the land. Mm -hmm. The problem is neither he nor his descendants have gotten any of the wealth from that land. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about. All right. So with that brief introduction, uh, Linda, please introduce yourself. Hi, Linda Pruitt Burton from Gregg County, Longview, Texas, White Oak, um, Muntean Anderson Pruitt. She is my mother. She was born of William and Ella Anderson and um, George Anderson is the father of William Anderson. Um, Ella Mosley father was Rufus Mosley. And there were wonderful, wonderful grandparents. And as I walk the grounds, I thank them so much for buying land that we have land that's still in our names today in family. The family still have the land. And it's just a great, great feeling. And again, it's a sad feeling because the damage has been done to the property. So, okay. Go ahead and finish, Lynn. I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. No, no talking. problem. You know, the, the um, property is damaged. It's contaminated. The ground is contaminated. Um, it's, it's just there. They, it's like all the um, equipment is left there and turned over that's not in use that's left on the property. Okay, so let's back all the way 
back here. And if you will, tell us about Mr. George Anderson. What a what an intriguing man he is. Based on the research that I have done of Mr. Anderson, I have looked through census reports. Um, I have looked through other documents. And of course, uh, you have provided me mounds of documents. And so I've, I've, you know, trekked through some of those documents and I'm beginning to get a sense of who Mr. Anderson was. And again, a remarkable man to have acquired Yes. In 1899, I mean, the tail end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, 188 acres of land. Tell us about George Anderson, Linda. Oh, wow. Of course. I, what I know is what my mother has shared with us. George Anderson, he was a wonderful man, very smart man. My mother always uh, put him in the category as uh, a doctor. You know, he took care of grandkids when injured. And um, he was a family man. He loved his children. Um, he bought property for his children. And the property is still there. Uh, George Anderson passed away at 107 years of age. Longevity is in our family. Um, and his granddaughter, Montine Anderson Pruitt, who's still with us, she's 101, had a birthday back April. Um, and the Anderson family, they were like a sorority group. They stuck together. They loved one another. They helped one another. Whenever someone was in need, there was someone always there. Um, they never fought against each other. They were there. And that's, that's what I, that's what I hold close to my heart with the Anderson heirs and, and how to me, I believe, um, they were like taking advantage of with different entities. So I don't know if you want to get into that or not at this point. But William Anderson, he was a great grandfather. Um, and my grandmother, Ella Mosley Anderson, was a wonderful, wonderful grandmother. Loving people. Um, they brought are they, in... Are they the two people on the screen here? Linda? Yes, yes. They brought in different ministers to their home. And that's where different ministers of the community came. And they had Sunday dinners at their home. They uh, put them up in their home. Um, they were just wonderful people. I can't say enough how they even worked in the community um, with church people. Uh, just they had, they grew their own vegetables. They had, they garden. Um, they had their own chickens, their own cows. They milked and they sold from their livestock. Um, my grandmother, I could hear my brother say they would go and sell butter, eggs from the livestock. Um, and also I remember my cousin who's 
98 or 96. She's in Dallas, Catherine. Um, she would tell the story she called Grandpa Papa. I remember Papa coming to Dallas dressed in his black suit with his horse and wagon going to see different legal people. And um, it's just a wonderful story, my four parents. I have a great, great family. Um, great story and a sad story. Okay. Now, one of the things that stands out about one of the obvious distinctions about George Anderson is that he was biracial. Yes. Yes. So what, what can you tell us about that? Do you know his? Well, uh, I, I can tell you from my mother, uh, Kenyan, the European is um, Scandinavian, Japanese, um, Asian, Kenya, the, I think it's like 51%. Um, and that's, you can see that in his facial structure. Um, yes, he was biracial. Yes. And, um, yeah, it's a sad story of how he mustered the strength, the, the will, the grit, the determination to buy almost 200 acres of land during Jim Crow, during yeah. Jim Crow in the South. And for his family yes. not to receive hardly any of that wealth. I have seen, you showed me a royalty check for 64 cents. <laughs> 64 cents. Am I right? You're right. There's, there's some for 89 cents um, to my mother, her sister. Um, I can call some of the names that I've seen these checks, Louise, uh, Perkeline, um, Audrey, um, and William. William Anderson had his own property. He bought property. It's separate from George Anderson. He has 79 acres and he walked 18 miles a day to pay for that and the house that's still standing in the community. Um, yeah, they receive that amount of royalty, 89 cent, 64 cent. Um, I don't think I ever seen anything above a dollar. So, so I want, I want, I want folks to understand what we're saying. Because a lot of people are not from Texas. They don't understand how this works. So here in Texas, if you buy property, if you buy real property, if you buy land, there is a chance that underneath the surface, underneath the land, there may be oil and gas under it. And it's, it's like the the land on top and the mineral minerals beneath are separate. One person can own the land. Another person can own the mineral rights. Yeah. Or the same person can own both. And what's, what typically happens is if the property owner who owns both the property and the minerals uh, want to make money off the oil and gas beneath his property, he can lease out or even sell the mineral rights. Um, 
that that's that's the way things uh, work here with 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 property. Now, Mr. Anderson, George Anderson, and as Linda just told us, William Anderson also had uh, almost a hundred acres. Um, you would think that with land rich in oil and gas, you would think that this would be one of the most wealthiest families in Texas. You would think that they would be millionaires many times over, but that's not the case. That's not the case. And why is that not the case? I mean, why, it, why is this family, why are they not millionaires? And I'm talking not only George Anderson, but his children, then his children's children, and his children's children's children children. I mean, that, that wealth from the property, the mineral rights underneath this property should have created enormous wealth with the family members, but that is not true. Am I right about that, Linda? You're exactly right. Um, you're right on point. Um, we grew up with oil wells in the back of the property. I've we been there and I've, I've seen those oil wells. Yes. Um, I've seen the up, oil pits. Yes. Um, William Anderson has, there's 18 wells. We grew up in shotgun houses uh, across the, uh, the creek. There was the oil wells that we would climb on and swing and jump off of and back into the creek water. Um, yeah. And we're going to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Linda. Yes. 18 oil wells. And Eight, 18 oil wells. Let's that stop William right there. Anderson has. That, that, that William your, Anderson has. Your grandfather. Yes. Eight, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold, hold, wait. 18 oil wells on his property. Yes. Your grandfather. William Anderson. This man. Yes. Him. 18 oil wells. Yes. 18 oil wells. <laughs> it's sad. And was your grandfather, William Anderson, was he a wealthy man? No. No, was sir. He, was he a poor man? Poor. Was he very poor? Very poor. So, a man... Who has who had eighteen oil wells on his property was a very poor man. Okay, so I mean the irony is all in front of you. Okay, the irony is there, and so many other people. And we we're not calling any names. But many other people, many other corporations, many other entities have mm -hmm. made millions of dollars. Is that right? <laughs> Try billions. It's one of the richest oil spots in East Texas. It's well, part right of the, next door to Kilgore, Texas. It's it's part of what's called the uh, East Texas oil field, right? Exactly. Yes. Nothing but oil and gas. And, um, you know, living, growing up, living poor. And, but you got through with love. 
um, and being taken care of wonderful, good food. Um, it's, you know, at Christmas, you know, we had uh, a bag of oranges and apples and walnuts. That was our Christmas gifts. And we were glad to get that. But wow. as, as I was growing up, I noticed, you know, me and my other cousins, when the 18 wheelers were come down our street, uh, we would always run to the end of the street to get them to blow their horns. And at one point, I started looking at the trucks and wondering why are they coming on our streets so much? And it's like something dropped into me that they're taken from us. They're taken from us. I was a kid, about 11 years old. And um, that was heartbreaking. And my mother worked two or three jobs. I'll I'll say that it has not been determined in a court of law that they were unjustly taking from your family. I do need to say that. Mm -hmm. However, again, George Anderson acquired 188 acres of land. Mm-hmm. That's 189. I, uh, yeah, well, it, it, it literally says 188.2, but right at 189, yes. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at some of the court documents, and there is a court case that goes back to the 30s. Um, Mr. George Anderson, according to his attorneys, was illiterate. And he was not of sound mind, according to the court filings. And that was the basis of their lawsuit. The basis of their lawsuit in the 30s was any sort of contracts that Mr. George Anderson entered are unenforceable, unconscionable, because he wasn't represented by an attorney. He was illiterate, and those contracts are very complicated. And according to his attorneys, he was his mind was not sound. Now, let me let me because you earlier said that he was really a smart man, and obviously he was in in in, in order to get 188 acres of land back in that time. I mean that's 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 difficult today. Yes. Okay. He was but to do it back then is exceptional. So what his attorneys alleged in their court filings is that by the time he began to sign leases and, uh, and um, uh, documents that he was aging and his mind had deteriorated by then. Okay. Which is a lie. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because that was the basis of their lawsuit, okay? And if if they were able to show, were able to prove that Mr. George was illiterate and was not of sound mind, then that was the basis for them to get those contracts and leases overturned. So, wow. yes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go... I'm going to go with what his lawyers filed in court, okay? That was the basis of their lawsuit. They were saying, Judge, every contract, every lease that Mr. Anderson signed, again, uh, is unenforceable, it is unconscionable, and they should be overturned. They should not be forced. They should not be enforced. I'm, I'm going with that. Now, I agree with you that, that Mr. George had to be 
of, of a really had to have a good mind when he acquired all that stuff. But according to his lawyers, the older he got, the worse his mind got. And um, that, that's, that's what uh, was said. Of course, the folks that he that they sued, he had a, he had a guard, he had a next of friend, Tom Tuttle, um, was next of friend in that 30s case. And, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't litigated. And the defendants, they denied all of that. So all I know is this, and all you know, what is obvious is this African-American man bought 188 acres of land that had a lot of oil, that has a lot of oil in it, on, under it, and neither he nor his family has profited or benefited from that, from that property. You still own the surface land, but, but beneath it, you have made pennies pennies, literally pennies on all that oil. I, you know, they also called him an unsound mentis in those reports. Unsound mind, mentis, negro. As I read, I cried many nights reading those documents. Two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, just in awe at how they treated my four parents like third world people, um, like animals. They're nobody. Who are the Andersons? There are no Anderson heirs when they were all alive. That's what I was told um, by my mother, Muntean. She dealt with a lot of the um, people. Um, so, and I believe that George did go to court and maybe won, but where's the money? Well, according to the court, according to the court documents that I've reviewed so far, um, they settled, which surprises me. Um, uh, when I when I read that they that he settled uh, with some of the defendants, uh, agreeing to certain deals that just turned out to be very uh, bad for him and his um, and you all, his family. Um, so yes, they settled. Uh, some of the defendants agreed to pay him a small amount of money in comparison to what this property uh, is worth. Right. Um, I saw in one court filing, one family paid $2,000 or something for the rights to the oil. Um, $2,000? It's probably a good piece of money back in the 30s, but in comparison to the millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars that have come uh, from underneath uh, that property, it, it, uh, it surprised me that they did not push it. But, you know, we, I wasn't back there. I don't know um, what, what, you know, all that was going on. We do know that, that it was Jim Crow. Yes, and it was in the 30s. Slavery was uh, about over, but it was still slavery, no matter how you look at it. That's right. Um, and they took advantage of our foreparents and still are. And I'm just so thankful to have you right now doing this story for us. It's a lot more to it. We're just barely touching it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's surprising that this has gone on for all these years and the story hasn't been told already. I mean, this should be a nationwide story. 
I mean, yeah. books, uh, documentaries, uh, television, uh, movies. I mean, this is this this is a this again. It may be the biggest loss of wealth by a single African American family in American history. I don't know. It could be. We believe it. We believe it. So, I know it's painful. It is. For you and um, for the rest of your family. And um, some of them are watching. I want to shout out to the family members. Um, and um, so we're... I yeah, I know my mother, um, she, um, I remember one well that was being dug. They wanted to uh, create a, dig a new well, and and she went out and fought with them and told them, you know, to get off her property. So they went down next to her sister's property. Louise, and um, so her sister called her and said, they're down here on my property. And so my mother jumps in her car and she goes down there with her gun and um, <laughs> I, I, yeah. I met <laughs> I met Miss Munting. She's a precious, precious woman. <laughs> yes, and so, but Anyhow, they still dug the well, and um, I have one cousin uh, that's no longer here with us, Linnell. We believe that she got sick from that well because um, the water was no longer good. Um, the, the well water, we could not drink. And, you know, there's been, we, the community just got water uh maybe uh 2008 2007 they went without water for uh almost a year and nobody came in to help nobody brought water to that community and I remember my mother saying, she said, I am numb. I have no feelings. Yeah, the environmental racism part of this story is also atrocious. Uh, you believe that some of your family members have uh, have been contaminated by some of the water and you know, from the grounds and maybe even yes. um, in the air and have suffered some sickness and diseases? Yes, the uh, saltwater pit. There's a huge saltwater pit right behind my mother's house. It's on her sister's property. Uh, how, how far is that pit from your mom's house? Oh, gosh, a quarter of a mile, if that, if that far. And my mother used to cheat ate off of her ground, her garden. That was her food. So when they put that well, that salt water pit in, our mother got very, very ill. Um, we didn't, we had no idea she was sick. Uh, and one night she collapsed going down the hall and we rushed her to the hospital and she had this infection in her lung called cryptococcus, um, ground from ground contamination um, on her lung. It's still there. And we would take her and get her checked um, frequently uh, for about a year. But the mask didn't get any bigger 
So, but it's still there. She had to get on very, very expensive antibiotics from this mask on her lung that came from ground contamination from that salt water pit. And um, we all had to pull together to get this medicine for our mother. Um, so that was another hurdle we got over. Um, but yeah, there's like five small saltwater pits going into this huge saltwater pit that contaminated the whole 79 acres uh, on William Anderson's and and George Anderson's saw it as well. His property is contaminated as well. Wow. So the water would we would put it in uh, ball jars and it would be brown. The water wow. is brown. Yeah. So, but mm. the city, yeah, the couple of the cities, White Oak, Longview, uh, I don't know about Kilgore, um, they got water in the community after a long fight that we had to fight for water and they're taking off all the resources. I mean, they're benefiting from the resources and we're struggling to get safe drinking water and to bathe then and had to go five miles to get water and by the time you got back your car truck is ruined with water splashing everywhere um no it's we it's a um it's been a struggle it still is a struggle and um the struggle is real. Um, it's depressing. Um, other family members, uh, my sister and I, just, we're like, this is so depressing, you know, living like this and knowing people that's benefiting from our property right under our noses. Um, These Man, these you're lost for words. Yeah, these these I have to say again, these are you know allegations, um, uh, meaning you know we can't say definitively legally that you know any of these folks have done anything wrong, um, and again there are court orders which have given them. Um, the right to do certain things. So, but it's important still to tell the story. The story needs to be told. The story needs to be told. And that's that's the purpose of, of, of us doing this today, um, to tell the Anderson and Mosley stories. Yes. Right? Yes. And there's um, my, there's a uh, grandfather, Smith um, Andrews, on all of my four parents, all of them had land and resources under their land. And we struggle living every day, paycheck to paycheck, um, in little bitty houses, um, caving in, roofs coming in, um, water coming in, and it's just painful. Uh, there's no other way to put it is living like this and knowing that there's a better life out there that was taken from them. And you want to, you're angry, but you know, we, we pray about this and God has the last say so. 
and we're just thankful for to get this with you this story we're we're so thankful so yeah i mean i may not be able to do anything else but uh, i definitely want uh to share you help you get your story out and and hopefully um you know the big the big wheels you know the oprahs the gail kings uh the big ones will hear about this story so that you all can can share your story with with the nation i think it is i think it is it is it worthy is to be told it is a racism it's very much racism that's the top of our story slavery and racism yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help us walk a fine line here of telling the story without uh, slandering anybody uh, and so forth. So, again, these are allegations. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to keep saying that. And we do know that America is has this racist legacy um, that's undeniable, completely undeniable. Uh, America's racist legacy and um, but yeah we do have to walk that fine line of of um, and I know you know you and, and other family members are like I don't care about that I I know that I know what has happened to our family and um, and I see it I you know it, it's it's a startling story which is yes, why I wanted to tell it we yes we are living it. We are yes. living it, and we hope um, it gets out. Well, as we come to a close, I will say this about the environmental racism part of this. Um, there is an African-American um, person who chairs the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. As a matter of fact, he is a an alum. He graduated. He and I went to the same college. I don't know him, but we attended the same university, North Carolina a t State University, go Aggies. Um, so he may be interested in hearing about this. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, Linda, we're coming to a close on this. Um, I hope that you feel like you have had the opportunity to at least scratch the surface, like you said, scratch the surface of the injustices that you all feel that you have experienced from this ordeal. It's very sad. It is a sad story of George and Anderson and William Anderson, the Mosleys, the Smiths, the Andrews. It's sad. Yes. Um, your mother, Miss Montine, um, you would like to show her face, and I yes. think that I think that that is a great idea to put a face with a name. Uh, this is the daughter of William William Anderson and the granddaughter of, um, George. of George Anderson. Yes, yeah. and Miss uh, Pruitt is up in age. How old is she now, Linda? She's a hundred and one. She's a hundred and one years old, and yes, her mind is not what it used to be. But no. but we do want to show her face. Yes, um, my husband. Yeah, we are getting her. We're rolling her in. Okay. As we speak. Okay. Very good. Uh, yes. Yes. Montine Anderson. She's a fighter. Boy, do I know that. Um, <laughs> I met her and enjoyed every second. My wife and I talk about Miss Pruitt all the time. Uh, back then, she was her mind was much better. We just enjoyed the afternoon that we spent with uh, with you all. Thank you. We appreciate it. Hold on just a second. Here she comes. Come on, 
The legend herself. Did you come and throw them all? There was a certain way that I like to make up like like we like I've been doing. This is Miss Montaigne Pruitt. She is the daughter of the late William and Ella Anderson. She's also and the mother of Linda Pruitt Burton and, um, and other children. I can't name all of them. I think I met Mark. Um, you, you, she you, said Anderson. Yeah, you were <laughs> And she has, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. Uh, she has been fighting the good fight of faith for many years to 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 get her family uh, justice. Mm -hmm. She is um, the last of the original heirs that's living. She's a hundred and one. Hundred and one years old. Yes, we're you, very blessed to have her. You look really, really good, Miss Pruitt. You look really good. <laughs> yeah, she is. She <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for for uh, bringing her in and allowing our audience to meet Miss uh, Pruitt. Um, yeah. My my grandmother was a hundred and one years old when she passed, and she was she was big mama. I mean, everything yeah. centered around my grandmother. So I understand um, Miss Pruitt's um, place in the Anderson Pruitt family. Yes. So we're honored that she was able to visit with us a few minutes today. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, mother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, you about got me in tears, Linda. Uh, I have. I am. That's a joyous tear. <laughs> it is. It's joy and sadness, to be honest with you. Yes. <laughs> it's joy having seen Miss Pruitt again, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's sadness thinking about this situation here. Um, yes, she's out of power. That storm that come through, she has no power at her home. At her home. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, wow. Br briefly describe her home for us. Uh, it's a little bit. We had some work done to it. We got her back home. We didn't want her in a nursing home. So we got her home up to par pre presentable for her to live there the remainder of her life. She has 24 hour care. Um, uh, she has nurses coming two or three times a week. She has an aide that comes three times a week. She has, uh, her home is three bedrooms, one bath, um, kitchen, living room. Um, that was added on to, you know, throughout the years as my growing up. Um, and I love out in Camp Switch. It's wonderful out there. It's peaceful. Um, especially late at night, the stars, you can see the stars. Uh, it's just a wonderful place to be. Out three in the bedroom. You said three bedroom, two bath? One bath, three bedroom, one bath. Should be a 20 bedroom house, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it should be. Well, it should be, yes, uh, 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 a castle. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, before we go, we keep seeing someone walk back and forth, and that person would be Mr. Burton, right? Yes. Yes. Can Mr. Burton please show his face? Yes. Yes. 
Can you see me, Mr. Augustus? Uh, almost. There we go. There it is. There's that handsome face right there. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. I just kind of been sitting up, uh, sitting beside my wife as a coach if she needed a drink of water. Or something. <laughs> yes. But, uh, uh, I appreciate again, uh, Linda and I have been married for 37 plus years. And I've, <coughs> and, and, we, and we've gone through this whole thing. Uh, I've tried to go through it with her. Uh, and uh, one thing I can say about the Anderson family, they are relentless. She has, she stayed with this thing. I, you know, we, we've worked with it. We've worked with all those who would help us trying to do something regarding the injustice that's been done to them. And I think Linda started out by, by telling you that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, but it's heartbreaking to see that something like that could happen and could happen to the extent that they received absolutely, and I can say this, having looked over the paperwork myself, absolutely nothing from billions of dollars in, in uh, resources that have been taken from that property. They still own the surface, but the surface is so contaminated. Now, I know myself that it's, it's hardly even, you know, it, it wouldn't be worth trying to live on. And that's what happens when uh, all that, all the petroleum was taken out and the lines have grown rusty. Some of the lines are open and some of the property is so contaminated. You get the smell on you when you try and walk through it. But uh, we have, uh, they have struggled. Uh, you know, I admire Linda and I admire her family for what they've done and for what they continue to do. And uh, more than anything else, we appreciate your aid and your assistance and just getting this story out there because we're sure that this is not the only story like this in East Texas. There are more people out there who had the same thing happen to them. So again, thank you. Thank you for uh, having us on and God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you for riding shotgun with uh, Linda and uh, helping her uh, get everything set up and everything. And um, before we close, um, we have gotten several comments from some, I believe, of your family members, um, Linda, and I want to read a couple of them. Um, okay. LaDonna, LaDonna Williams says, I am one of the members of this family, and I have heard stories as a child growing up about the enormous amount uh, of wealth our family has, uh, has, has never been able to access. Uh, Amelia Felder, Felder, pardon me, says, sad story. Um, Samiki Campbell, happy Juneteenth to our family, matriarch. We love you, big mama. LaDonna Williams, great grandma, Jet, and mama, Ida, lived on the property. Mama Jet was chronically ill. Uh, with blackened legs, she had to have fluid removed frequently from her body. Very sad and scary as a child. Those are some of the comments, I think, from some of your family members, um, Linda. Um, so they have been tuned in. So um, there, may, there may be a part two and a part three of this, uh, because, again, we've scratched the surface only. And yes. um, we, we may need to come back. And um, we just got another comment from Dave, David Mathis. Great job, Linda and Darcy. Love you, big mama. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, your family is toned in. And uh, so I'm gonna get off here before I literally start shedding tears, okay? Oh, thank you're, you, you're, Augustus. You're, you're, I you're, have, and I, I really appreciate you. And we pray that you come back and we will have part two, three, and so on. Okay. Let's, so, so, we're, so we're making that announcement now. There's going to be a part two, and we will probably include some of the other family members um, right. so that they can, you know, just, just share their stories um, of what has happened here. Um, so part two is coming. Give us a little time, a few days, a week or so, and we'll come back with part two. So, Linda, that is all for today. 
Again, thank you for tuning in and joining me today. And I hope everything was to your liking uh, and to your family. Okay? Thank you. Thank so we're out. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks.